Good morning, everyone. Welcome from Imagination Online Experience. Today we are going to discuss an amazing Japanese artist, Katsushika Hokusai. Today is lesson number four from the course Art History for Everyone. And I'm so happy that you're joining me for this class. Katsushika Hokusai was an incredibly famous artist that popularized Japanese art everywhere around the world. His images became iconic, just like me today wearing a t-shirt with an image of his work. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure you all are familiar with this beautiful view. of uh, one of his woodblock prints. Hokusai lived most of his life in Edo, which is now called Tokyo. He was really famous even in his lifetime and everybody wanted to have to own his work. Katsushika Hokusai was born in Edo, which is now called Tokyo, in 1760, over 250 years ago. He created a new style in painting called Ukiyo-e, which translates into scenes from the floating world. He led a long life filled with art. He changed his name many times in his career, over 30 times. This was allowed for Japanese artists to change the name when they changed their style, or maybe when their social position changes. Katsushika Hokusai was the name he used for half a century. And it means Katsushika stands for a part of the Edo region and Hokusai means North studio. He also called himself Sori, Kako, Taito, Gakoin, Mani. From the age of 75 he started calling himself Gakyoroi, which means the old man crazy to paint. And he was. He worked from the sunrise till sunset. He dedicated all his life to art. When Hokusai was 88, he started signing, marking his pictures with a red seal with a character 100. This was like a talisman to bring him long life because he really wanted to live till the old age or even become immortal. 
Hokusai, despite being a very productive artist, working so hard every day and producing a huge volume of art, around 30,000 artwork in his lifetime. In his mid Midlife, he struggled with some hardship. Both of his wives and two children died. He was struck by a lightning and he also had a stroke, after which he had to relearn his art. He was also forced to pay off his grandson's debts, which left him without any money. All these events led him to do what he loved best. And that was the time when he started painting and working on the famous 36 views of Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji isn't actually a mountain at all. It is the highest peak in Japan and it is an active volcano. And thanks to Hokusai's work, now everyone can recognize the shape of this mountain. There is a belief that this mountain is a place where gods live and it's a source of immortality. Maybe that's why Hokusai decided to choose this topic for his series of woodblock prints. There is a story called The Tale of a Bamboo Cutter where a goddess leaves an elixir of life on the top of the mountain. Hmm. I wonder if it's still there. <laughs> Katsushika Hokusai was a great artist but also a great showman. Once he made a painting so enormous it could be seen only from the rooftops. Another time he painted two sparrows on the grain of rice. <laughs> but his most famous artwork that everybody recognize is this, sometimes called the Great Wave, but in reality it's called the Under the Wave of Kanagawa. This is a color woodblock print and it was produced in thousands of impressions. 8,000 prints were made and this would make it very affordable in Hokusai times. Anyone could buy his print for the value of two servings of rice. 
What's really interesting and striking is the composition. Look at the wave overtaking. It's dominating the picture and Mount Fuji that can be seen very, very small in the background seems not that important at all. When you look closer, you will also notice three boats with people who bravely deliver fish to Edo. They're facing the storm and braving huge waves. Hokusai used a new and revolutionary color in this print. It's called Prussian Blue. It was a new synthetic color that came from Prussia. And you can see it in many of his woodblock prints. So I would like to share with you some of the images from the series 36 views of Mount Fuji by Katsushika Fukusai. This type of prints, which was very popular between 17th and 19th century in Japan, is called Yukioe prints. And they scenes of everyday life, peaceful, full of harmony, very often have asymmetrical composition. Do you know what it means, asymmetrical? Right, you can see it really well on the picture of the great wave. The wave is on one side, while on the other side, it's empty. So it's not symmetrical. It's not the same on both sides. These prints had a limited palette of colors and that's because how they were made. There was a separate block of wood which was carved separate for each color. That's why there's usually up to four colors and black. This perspective is really interesting. It's very different to the way Europeans would paint perspective. There's a lot of curved lines that guide you through the composition. The shapes are outlined with a strong color and they made of solid flat surface. During Hokusai's life, strict Japanese policies didn't allow to export or import any artwork abroad. But this changed in 1850s and this is when people in Europe started discovering the amazing work 
Aikatsushi Kahokusai. Many artists, including Vincent van Gogh, his brother Theo, strongly influenced by these prints. In one of his letters, Van Gogh wrote, all my art is to some extent influenced by Japan. Monet owned, owned 23 prints by Japanese artists famous composer Debussy. He composed a piece called La Mer, purely taking inspiration from this wonderful print of the wave. There is even a picture where we can see him with another composer, Igor Stravinsky, and there's clearly visible great wave of Kanagawa displayed on their wall. The art of Katsushika Hokusai changed art history forever. Are you ready to start creating your own artwork inspired by Katsushi Kahokusai and his 36 views of Mount Fuji? Well, I hope so. What we're gonna do for this project, we are going to use watercolors, only limited colors, just like they did in Japan. And also, you are going to use your black outliner to outline the finished and dried picture. So make sure you prepare your space, prepare your watercolors, and you can also have your reference picture ready. Let's go. Okay, everyone, I hope you set up your space. Remember to cover the desk or table you're working on with some plastic sheet or newspapers because today we are going to use watercolor paints. So I prepared here two examples of the ukiyo-e prints. Both of them have the famous Mount Fuji. That's the red Fuji and this is the famous great way of Kanagawa. So you can choose whichever picture you would like to draw and this landscape in watercolor inspired by woodblock prints that we are going to do today is actually very different to landscapes in traditional European art. First difference that you notice is lack of the line of horizon. Look, usually we start our landscape with noticing the line of horizon. Here there is none. So it is much flatter and at the same time easier to draw. So wonderful. I'm gonna choose today this picture, the red Fuji. I'm gonna leave it here as my reference and I'm gonna use some watercolor paper I have but you can use any paper or your sketchbook for watercolors, the best paper is the, the thicker one, which have a little bit um, 
which can drink the water a little bit better. Wonderful! So let's start with a sketch. Our first step in this activity will be sketching the outlines. In my case, it will be sketching the outlines of Mount Fuji. Have a look. It's asymmetrical, like all Yukioi prints. That means that it's different on one side and different on the other side. So my Mount Fuji starts at the almost at the bottom of the page, and on this side it goes up to half of the page. The peak of the mountain is somewhere here. And can you see it's not flat because it's a volcano? So we can try to replicate that angle, that angle of the Mount Fuji. So it will give you the best feel of it. That's it. So this is the, the quick sketch of the shape of Mount Fuji. What else is there on this picture? Well, we can see there's a bit of snow on the peak. It looks a little bit like icing on top <laughs> of a yummy mountain. Let's do a bit of icing on top. And we're gonna leave these spaces white. Okay, what else? Wow! The wealth of clouds covering the sky. They are elongated clouds covering the whole sky. So I'm just going to very gently outline some of the clouds. Very good everyone. So keep looking and keep checking that your picture is drawn in the same style as the one done by Katsushika Hokusai. Because today we are learning how to draw and style of woodblock prints by this incredible Japanese artist. Can you see that suddenly at the bottom the clouds are so thick there's nothing left but clouds. There's more white than blue. You can feel a bit lost in the wonderful clouds surrounding Mount Fuji. So what day, what part of the day it is, do you think? Is Mount Fuji really red? Be sunset or sunrise. Who knows? 
Katsushika Hokusai also painted Mount Fuji in pink. We also have lots of little lines here at the bottom, which I'm going to do after with a black Sharpie or a black pen that is waterproof. But we're going to use these pens only when your watercolor picture is dry. One more thing I'm going to do. Can you see there's a little space for signature? I'm going to include that in my picture as well. Although I can't really write in Japanese. I may do something else in this space. Okay, get your paints ready. And now it's time to cover your picture with colors. I wonder if I can replicate that incredible Prussian blue. I think it's gonna be this color. So I'm just making sure, as always, I'm going to put some water in my watercolor to make a puddle of color. And I'm going to start with the sky. sky to be quite deep dark blue so I'm gonna get more and more paint on my paintbrush quite often and now I'm painting around the clouds leaving them white as the paint doesn't have to have much details it's just to give you the idea of the shape of your Fuji mountain
good. I'm really happy with how the clouds turned out. Now is the next step, is the lovely red. Okay, where is my testing paper? Oops, sorry. My testing paper is required here because I need to decide on the shade. On the shade of red. This red is too pinky for me. I need something more deep, like red wine, red. Oh, this one will be probably good if I add even more water. So this color will be fantastic for my red Fuji. I can also use this bright red. Yes. So I'm gonna use these two shades of red. And you see that the top of the Mount Fuji is a little bit brownish, brownish black. So I'm gonna mix these two colors, brown and black, to get the right shade. So a bit of red, a bit of brown, and a bit of black. And I can do the very top of Mount Fuji. Before you start doing that, make sure that the space around it is dry. Otherwise, your colors will bleed, which means they will mix. Unless it's the effect you want to achieve, it's okay. I don't want my colors to, to mix this time. You can use a smaller brush if you have one. Use a tiny bit of black on top. And now I'm gonna go into the reddish. What's your favorite part of this picture? really good to create your own colors and mix those available in your palette.
everyone. So this is the moment. When the color starts to change. So I'm just going to use some water. Put some clean water and I can transfer into the green. Let me check if that's the green I want to use. No, I think I'm going to go for the Mixing two different shades again, lighter and darker green. And that's where the colors meet. So this is how the finished picture looks like. Some of the colors are mixing together at the bottom of Mount Fuji. This effect, as I mentioned, is called bleeding. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to leave my red Mount Fuji to dry totally. If you're in a rush, you can also use a hairdryer if your mom and dad are okay with that. And then we're gonna use some black pens to do the outlines for our watercolor picture inspired by woodblock prints. Well done everyone, I think you did an incredible job today. Now when your painting is dry, you can include, just like in the original piece, some very small lines at the bottom of the mountain, which will uh, which will be like a forest or some trees, very tiny trees growing at the feet of Mount Fuji. I'm gonna do that quickly. If you wish, you can also <coughs> include some writing in that bottom part. So I'm just using mark making and I'm using very small lines. You can also do shape of a triangle if you wish. I'll just continue doing that throughout the picture. Amongst the many works of great painter and illustrator and print designer Katsushika Hakusai, there is a three-volume 
album of drawings. Hokusai's lost manga, the woodblock printed picture books that were intended for artists as reference books to learn how to draw by copying the pictures. But they were enjoyed by many other people who just liked looking at the skillful drawings. Manga in Hokusai times actually meant informal drawings. And today I would like to share this wonderful book with you. So it has different subjects like landscapes, architecture, people doing different jobs, animals, real and imaginary. Here we have some dragons. There's a lot of fish. And a huge wave amongst the waves. This book was published for the first time in 1814. Let's have a look at it together.
great success of the 36 views of Mount Fuji, Hokusai decided to take up another subject. The tour of the waterfalls of the provinces was a set of eight woodblock prints that he executed with great mastery. You can see one here and he used a vertical orientation this, this time just to give the waterfall a full range of expression. This was the first series on this subject ever published in Japan. Hokusai was really innovative in how he depicted the moving water. This set of prints represents the importance of waterfalls in Japanese culture because waterfalls in Japanese beliefs and spiritual practices have a special meaning. They more than just a scenic attraction, they often closely related to Shinto nature worship and Buddhist philosophy. Prints of waterfalls were more than just the pretty postcards. They represented the religious pilgrimage to the actual sacred place. Let's have a look together at those eight waterfalls. Ayogaka Falls and this is Ono Waterfall. Robin Waterfall The Amida Falls Have a look at the two men enjoying their picnic on the cliff. Kirifuri Waterfall The waterfall where Yoshitsune washed his horse. According to legend, a warrior Yoshitsune washed his horse during a military campaign. Yoro waterfall. This is known for it as a source of miracles. Its waters were thought to have healing properties. And the last one, Kiyotaki Kanon Waterfall. Thank you so much for joining me today in lesson number four about Katsushika Hokusai. I hope his art inspired you just like it inspired artists throughout the ages. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week.